Well, I am excited about this particular message. Um, <laughs> it's a little different. It's going to be a little bit different. It's going to start with some similarity, but over the course of the next few weeks, I believe that um, we're going to expand and teach some things that are rarely taught and believe God to open our understanding as... Uh, as the Apostle Paul said in Ephesians chapter 1, I pray that your eyes, being enlightened, right, in the knowledge of him. And so, in the wisdom and the knowledge of him. So, there is so much to gain and understand about the kingdom of God. And, uh, you know, when I was preparing this message, the Lord kind of dropped a, a title on me that I thought was a little unusual. But um, it turned out that he qualified it, and he said, basically, go for it. I'm going to give you what you need in the process. So I hope the, the title doesn't disturb you. <laughs> there are a couple of parts where I'm going to have uh, our elder Joel come up to us, and uh, he's going to help me on a couple of areas that I believe that uh, he will be able to contribute to this. Um, all right, so the message is entitled, For the Good of the Realm. For the Good of the Realm. I know that almost sounds a little archaic or medieval as we talk about a realm, but it's going to be beneficial when we understand all that this entails. Let me begin by giving you a scripture. The wind blows where it lists. This is John 3, 8. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound, but you don't know where it's coming from or where it's going. So is everyone. I want you to hear that. So is everyone that is born of the Spirit. That means... When you are born of the Spirit, you're not bound alone in the earthly realm. You are brought into another realm that moves and breathes. And people who are part of that realm experience the leading, the direction, the guidance, and the inspiration that only people who are in that realm can experience. In other words, when we are in the spiritual realm, we are literally activated to be in tune with God. Now, I know that some people can uh, make that or take that and try to make it into some kind of spooky session or some kooky weirdness. And at times that does happen because any time, I used to tell my, my older son Daniel this, any time the Spirit of God falls on any flesh, who knows what can happen because people can get kooky and weird and, and all kinds of things can happen. But... That's just the flesh reacting to the spirit realm. But the spirit realm is still in itself a realm that is um, very seldom visited and certainly very seldom acclimated or uh, brought to use, brought to, brought to uh, fruition or brought to experience, brought, brought to a place of encounter. Uh, very, very seldom. All right. Now, when I was thinking about this particular verse and this particular title of message for the good of the realm, I asked the Lord, I said, Lord, do you have a scripture? I need a powerful scripture. I need something that really makes the point. I mean, because I couldn't think of anything. I couldn't think of anything <laughs> to... Uh, and I have a pretty good scriptural mind, and I couldn't come up with, a, with anything that would uh, quite cut it. Uh, but I hadn't sat down 
at my computer for more than a moment. And this verse came to me. Joshua chapter 5, 13 through 15, and I'm going to read it. I want you to listen up now. When Joshua was by Jericho, this is after Moses had died, he lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, a man was standing before him with his drawn sword in his hand. And Joshua went to him and said to him, Are you for us or for our adversary? A modern way of saying that is, are you for us or against us? I mean, because back in the day, this is what they did. They had to deal with battles they had to overcome. This is on the verge of facing Jericho. They were getting ready to take Jericho. And he says, are you for us or against us? Are you for us or are you for our adversaries? And he answered and said, no. <laughs> I want you to think about that for a minute. He didn't say, I'm not for you and I'm not against you. He didn't say, I'm for neither. He said, no. Like you're totally off, buddy. Like you are totally out of sync with what's going on. I'm not here for you. You're here for me. Look at what he said. He said, no, but I am the commander of the army of the Lord. And now I have come. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and worshipped. And said to him, what does my Lord say to his servant? And the commander of the Lord's army said to Joshua, Take off your sandals from your feet, for the place that you are standing is now holy. And Joshua did so. You say, well, what was going on here? Basically, you have man, Joshua, and the army of Israel camped and getting ready to face Jericho and to take it down. And the commander of the army of the Lord, this is not a normal man, I'm sure you've gathered this. This is an angelic or uh, Christophany. This is, some call this a pre-incarnate uh, appearance of God or of Christ in the form of the angel of the Lord. And what he does is he tells Joshua, you're in the wrong realm. You have no idea of what is happening in the spirit. You have no idea what's going on in the realm of the spirit. I'm not here for you. You need to get on page with me. You need to be awoken and made alert about the things that really matter. You think you're going to take Jericho without me? You think you're going to accomplish any feat without me? You are not mindful of spiritual things. That's something that Jesus rebuked Peter with. He used that same terminology when Peter said, the Bible says Peter took Jesus aside and began to rebuke him because Jesus had said he was going to go to Jerusalem and there he would be killed and handed over and all that. And Peter rebuked him and said, Lord, don't say such things. That will not happen. And Jesus says, get behind me, Satan, because you are saying things that be of man. You are not mindful of the things of God. You are not in the right mind. You are not realizing there is a way bigger picture, Peter, going on right now, and you need to get into it. You know, we have this mindset about acclimating and drawing to ourselves spiritual things 
for our particular participation. We're going to be in the Spirit today. You know, have a, have a kind of a visitation from God. Momentarily, of course, because after this, I've got some other fish to fry. But today is Sunday, so I think I'll honor the Lord. And give him a little time. And that's kind of what we're accustomed to. What do we say to those who don't even value it from that point of view? But nevertheless, that point of view may sound like it's correct. And it is correct in the sense that that's what is the atmosphere of many churchgoers and many Christians. But that is not understanding the realm of the Spirit. We, too, are often too earthly and placate with spiritual things only for the needed sufficient time for our benefit. And then we go back to normal life. Now, here comes a question of honesty. How many can admit that that has been the case with you at some point in your life? Even I could admit that. There are times that we do spiritual things simply for the point of doing spiritual things. But as soon as those spiritual things are over, we go right back to typical self. I was sharing with my brother Joel and talking to him about this particular message. And um, he said to me, he said, boy, it's funny how you explain it like that. And when you say it like that, he goes, because I just read a devotional just the other day. And that is practically in different wording, a different approach, but Practically the same exact thing you just said. And he was pondering these things. So I'm going to have Joel come up with me. And uh, I'm going to have him, before we get into the seriousness of the realm, I'm going to have him talk a little bit about what I just said uh, from the perspective of this particular devotional. So here's the devotional that I was reading yesterday morning. I'll just read a few sections of it. Could it be that even though you are God's child, you still think of your life as belonging to you? When you think of your life this way, then ministry is about stepping out of your life, giving God a little bit of your time, energy, and money, and then stepping back into your life. In this way of thinking, ministry is something separate from your daily life. But behind this view of ministry is the thought that your life still belongs to you and you give moments of it to the Lord for his work. The view of ministry in the New Testament is radically different. For example, in Ephesians 4, 1 through 6, 1 Corinthians 12, Colossians 3. The New Testament is quite clear in its call to us to understand that our lives no longer belong to us. We don't own our physicality. We don't own our emotionality. We don't own our spirituality. We don't own our mentality. We don't own our psychology. We don't own our communicative abilities. We don't own our relationships. We don't own our gifts or our experiences. We don't even own our possessions in the deepest sense of what ownership means. Paul gets at this when he says at the end of a discussion of sexuality, and I just want to insert something. Sometimes you hear the expression people talk about their sex lives. At the end of a discussion of sexuality in 1 Corinthians 6, Paul makes a statement, you are not your own, for you were bought with a price. Let me just uh, say, you know, this is interesting because him and I had not conferred or talked 
about what I was preaching until I told him what I was preaching and he told me he already had that devotion where that was the preeminent thought. This is, this is serious business. And what we're going to try to unfold, and he's got a little bit more to read, but what we're going to try to unfold over the next several weeks is where are we and what are we doing for the good of the realm? You see, because the true realm of the Spirit is where we need to live, not visit. We need to have a habitation in that realm, not a visitation. We need to not live our lives as if they are our lives. Boy, this this can radically change the way you view everything. It's like literally being translated or transferred from one place, a kingdom, to another and identifying yourself with that kingdom. You don't communicate, you don't relate, you don't connect and live by the conditions and the rules of the previous kingdom. Because you're not of that kingdom, you're in a new kingdom, you're in a new realm. And, and we are not supposed to be taking a dab will do you when it comes to God. Now, I'm not saying you have to become some type of religious wacko, but you ought to be a wacko for Jesus, if I could say. You ought to be living in the realm of of the Spirit of God, because that is the realm you are part of. And I think sometimes we don't shed our clothes or shed our belongings, and we have a mindset of belonging still to our previous realm and only partake partly in the realm of God, and that is an error. That is an error that we live in, that we live by. Are you following me? We need to change that. We need to, we need to focus, and we need to be into the spirit realm. Give a little more. Okay, I just want to make one comment before I read. We've been studying the book of Colossians in Bible study, and in chapter 3 in the beginning, it says that our focus should be on the things above where Christ dwells and not on the earth. And it's either or. It doesn't say you can dabble in both. It says think on the things that are above. Doesn't mean that we can't enjoy life now or be grateful for uh, the things that God created, but it's not to be our main focus. We are told, in essence, to make a choice or that we have a choice either focusing on things that are above or things that are on the earth. Let me, let, me, let me add one more thing into this. Jesus told us a story about a great wedding banquet that was put together. And the people were all invited and so on. And when he was going around greeting his guests, he comes across somebody who was sitting kind of all by himself, in a chair at one of the banquet tables. You know, there's people all over the place, but this one guy was there, and he was, the, the, the banquet MC was, was surprised, and he was like, and he walks over to me, he says, friend, he says, you know, he says, what are you doing here? What are you doing here? And he's like, well, you know, I, I was invited, and you know, I wanted to be here. And he goes, you've, you've come here, and to be an honored guest here and to be part of this banquet and you don't even have the decency to change your clothes. Sitting there in his common clothes or common garments from his life and didn't understand the import of being in the banquet hall of God. In the real realm of God. 
living in and amongst the king at his table. And he was sitting there with kind of a nonchalant approach, right? A nonchalant approach, wearing old clothes from his previous life and had no respect or understanding that he was in another place. We cannot be found like that. Remember that scripture I gave you for the beginning of the world in crisis, church on the move? It said that Jesus gave a warning for those going through the the terrible time of trial that will come upon the whole world. He said, blessed is he that watches and keeps his garment, lest he walk naked and they see his shame, that his life is exposed. That's what happened to this guy. His life was exposed because he was wearing the clothes from another world, from another realm, when he ought to have been dressed and living in the right realm. So let let this kind of work in you while he continues. There is a second thing that the New Testament makes very clear. It is that God has called all his children not to be mere recipients of his kingdom work of grace, but to be instruments of that work as well. It is what I call the total involvement paradigm. That is, all God's people all the time. Every one of God's children has been given a call to ministry, and every one must think of himself or herself that way. Finally, The New Testament does not teach a separation between life and ministry. Every dimension of your life is a forum for ministry. Marriage is ministry. Friendship is ministry. Parenting is ministry. Being a neighbor is ministry. The workplace is a place of ministry. You have been called to represent a glorious Savior who has graced you with everything you need to live with a ministry mentality. Okay. All right, so just uh, grab a seat over there and be mindful if I need you again. (laughs) So I looked up the word realm for this particular message, and it's, This is what I got, a domain or a province, a sphere or a kingdom in which a particular activity occurs or operates. We could call it the kingdom of God, but it's actually bigger than that. We could call it the spiritual domain, or I'm calling it the realm. Do you remember when the apostles were going about the ministry? They were going about preaching the gospel. And they started to head into Asia Minor, or a particular area in Asia. And they were heading in that direction. And then the Holy Spirit shows up. And it says, he forbid them for going in there. So you say, well, what are you talking about? Well, these guys were on a mission, right? They were on the mission to preach the gospel and going into any area that they could find. They wanted to make the gospel known to the whole heathen world, and that was the intent. However, we don't have the freedom or the rights to kind of do things on our own. You know how many churches get in trouble when you do things on your own without following the leading of the Holy Spirit who dwells in the realm. And if we somehow step out, and I did this, I did this just a couple years ago. We talked about it at our prayer meeting here. I feel that, you know, I missed the boat on something very important for our church. And that was when we moved from uh, the realtor building that we were renting to the Cabot House, which we were there for three and a half years. And I felt the Lord had moved us on, and I had a mindset, because we were, we were packed out with people, and we had zeal, we had zest, we had direction, we felt we had a particular vision to go for the harvest. We were going to become kind of a mini mega church of some sort, and we were going to move into this building, not this one, but the Cabot House, and we were going to have 
you know, a influx of hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands of people. And I was seeing that, or thinking I was seeing that, or, or feeling that. And I was confused and had to be taught by the Lord himself because the church struggled. It struggled. I don't want to go into the details because, honestly, it's just too depressing. But the church struggled in so many areas that the elders and myself would scratch our heads trying to figure out what was wrong. Why are the people so apathetic? Why, do they, uh, why are they falling out? And I don't mean falling out in the spirit. I mean falling out the door. <laughs> Why, 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 were, why were they not here? Why, were there, why was there such a disinterest, lack of... Everything had just seemed to stop and come to a halt. For three and a half years, we plugged away. And we just hit a brick wall. And finally, after we came here and then bought this building, I was not happy about coming here. I didn't want to buy this building. I didn't want to do that at all. I was mad that we didn't have the type of harvest that we were supposed to have, I thought, on the hill. We had prayer meetings to deal with some things here. We had three days, three nights of prayer meeting. And on the second night prior to coming here, I woke up in the morning that morning and the Lord spoke to me and said, I'm going to tell you what the problem is and what the problem was. And he said, truly, I gave you a vision to be on the hill. I gave you that 19 years earlier. And I did give you that. And I fulfilled that. But you lost sight of the direction. And you went for a harvest when I was bringing you into the labor field. You were supposed to be building a church for the labor field. Remember when Jesus had said in his word, truly the harvest is great, but the laborers are few? I never focused our church in laboring. I always kept focusing on the harvest, the harvest, the harvest. We're going to be like the big churches out there that are, that are, that are dealing with thousands. We're going we're gonna, to we're gonna sweep the world and be a regional church and all this kind of stuff. And he says, you lost, I, I couldn't get you to slow down. So I allowed those things to take place in the body to bring you into a place of derision, <laughs> dismay, so that you would come to me and say, where did I err? And once I finally decided I was going to take the hit and take the blame, God said to me, so the vision you saw was right about the hill, but it was only for a short time. It was only for a season. He said, now I'm going to bring you from the hill to the valley, and now you're going to labor. And you're going to labor, and you're going to build a church of laborers. And this was the topper to what had prophetically been given to us just prior to the move, about Eight months before we actually came here, I was in the mode, and so was all our elders. We were clearly in the mode of, we're going to build a harvest. We're going to have a great harvest here. We're going to overcome the world. We're going to do this. We're going to do that. And God said to me, <laughs> when I wasn't expecting, he sent a word by a person in our body who was leaving the church. And they said, I have a word that God gave me while I was in prayer for you, and I wrote it down, and I didn't want to, I didn't want to bring this to you, but I really feel I must, I believe for sure I heard from God on this. And I'm like, you know, okay, cool. You know, I, I'm hoping it's a good one. You know, <laughs> I took, took it and I read it, and... I was disgusted with what I read. Sometimes people give me things and I'm disgusted <laughs> with what I read. No, this was, this was terrible. It said, I am moving you. I'm taking you from this place. 
I'm going to take you from this place. Now, we were at the height of believing we were going to change the world from the top of the hill. So this was foreign. This was totally contrary to, the, to where I was and where my team was. Oh, yeah, you're going to share some of the blame. <laughs> this was totally contrary. And you know why it was? Because it was from the realm that I should have been in, that I should have been listening to. And the realm, word from the realm has come, right from the throne of the king. And it said, I'm taking you from this place, and I'm going to bring you to another building that you will not like. And I'm like, I mean, I'm sitting on 19,000 square feet. On the top of the hill, I'm like, I ain't going anywhere. This is, this is it. This is the big deal. And he said, I'm taking you from this building to a place you're not going to like, to another building that you're not going to like. He goes, but you will convert that building, and you will convert the people in it. And then, of course, the whole story of how we got here and all that was just a miracle unfolding and so on. So what was that all about? That was the betterment for us, the betterment for you and for me who are part of this body. The better and the, the best is for the realm, not for me. Not for my little world. Or my little vision. For the good of the realm, we do and live and move and have our being. Not for my private enterprise. And certainly not for my kingdom. Or any preacher's kingdom. Or any pastor's so-called kingdom. That's a foul misdirection to do anything else but for the good of the kingdom. Are you hearing me? If I can learn and be directed like the apostles who were directed in the Holy Spirit said, oh, no, 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 you're not going into Asia now. You'll go later, but I'm not letting you go now. It's like word from the realm has arrived and you better listen. And those apostles turned and went another direction. Same thing we had to do here. You know why? Because I heard from the realm. Now here's the problem. I should have not been outside of it to have to pay attention to the leading of the realm and the leading of the spirit. Okay. Yet... In opening up this teaching, there's so much to give you. That we're, we're going to really build this and really open your eyes about the spiritual realm, the, this, this place that we ought to be living in. So first I want to say, I'm going to talk for a few minutes about some things, uh, and then we'll, I'll cut this sermon short because I, I want to encourage people who are not here to be here next week as we take this deeper. Um, but for those of you who are here, I'm going to give you a couple of things, beginning with some of the simple things about operating in the realm, operating in the spirit, okay? So I want to tell you that you can all breathe now. <laughs> You're all like on the edge of your seat going, what's he going to say? I want to give you some simple things about Christianity, about being Christians who believe in the moving and operation of the spirit. We are charismatic. We we have Pentecostal understanding, and we have been and believe thoroughly in the baptism of the Holy Spirit, right? So we believe in the gifts and the operation of the Spirit, and we have seen them operate. Um, and so in the early stages of understanding aspects of the realm, of the spirit realm, I want to teach us a couple of things that I believe are very important for us to see and understand that when we're gathered together in the church, there is, a, there is an etiquette. There's an order to things. And no church 
knew this better or found out this better than the Corinthian church. The Corinthian church had two standout issues concerning spiritual gifting. You know what they were? They were a church that was very gifted. They were also a church that was full of chaos and mayhem. (laughs) However, the Holy Spirit did not shut them down, but instead lifted them up and gave them instruction because they simply needed order. When we're operating in the realm of the Spirit, we need to be paying attention to the rules. And in the, in the first century, each church developed its own sense of ordina- ordinances or directions or, and orders and, and particular mannerisms of, of, of the Spirit and how to conduct that. Paul gave them 1 Corinthians 14, and I want to begin. I know I won't get finished with it. It's... Um, so, but I want to I give a little bit of it to begin to start. Um, and before I give you, well, no, I'll, I guess I'll read it first. Let's, I'm going to read the whole thing and then give you a beginning stages of what I want to share on this. So looking at 1 Corinthians 14, 26 to 40, we are going to put it up on the board. And it says this. This is the Apostle Paul trying to do just what we're talking about. He said, what then, brothers? When you come together, each one has a hymn or a lesson or a revelation or a tongue or an interpretation. Let all things be done for the building up. If any man speaks in a tongue, let there be by two or at most three and each in turn. And then let someone interpret for Pete's sake. I added the Pete's sake. But if there's no one to interpret, then let each one of them keep silent in the church and speak to himself and to God. As for prophets, let two or three prophets speak. Now that prophets can also mean prophetic people, people who are not necessarily walking in the office of prophet, but they are prophetic, meaning they have prophetic words. They give words that build up, encourage, edify, and, ex- and exhort. And he says, let them be by two or at most three, and let the others weigh what is said. Let there be some proper judgment. Sometimes people get up and say things that are, that are not right. They're not in the realm. They're not right. They're not in the spirit. They're in the flesh. And they, they, they have well-meaning intention on what they say. But it actually can be counter to the realm. It can be counter to the spirit. Counterproductive. And even harmful sometimes. So, he goes on. If a revelation is made to another sitting there. Oh, I had a, an, an idea, a thought that the Lord gave me. Let the first one silence up, be silent. For you can all prophesy one by one so that all may learn and be encouraged. And the spirit of the prophets are subject to the prophets, for God is not a God of confusion, but of peace. He's not a God of confusion, but a God of peace. Now, I'm going to just jump on this to begin with and give you some practicalities. There's more to read. I, I just don't want to read the whole thing now. I'm feeling that might, that might uh, it may be distracting. Okay. So if you've been in, the, in Hillcrest Church long enough, you've heard me teach on what I call theme, tenor, and flow. What is so important uh, in the realm of the spirit and in people who are so-called spirit-filled. Um, and I'd like to think that if you truly are spirit-filled, that when you leave here, the spirit doesn't stay here. He goes with you. You know, in other words... You continue on in the realm even when you get out of these doors. You don't exit the realm and go, ha ha, now back to my fleshly indulgence. Now that my spiritual commercial break is over. Um, It's important that theme, tenor, and flow when we are gathered is in operation. What do I mean by theme? What do I mean by theme? There is an order of basics. Theme means setting of the ambience and the prominent idea or the storyline of whatever's coming forward. In other words, when God is working among us, which is under the assumption in your gathering, in our assembly, there is a particular theme we're going to go in. We're going to enter into a theme. And it's important that 
you understand that the Holy Spirit works within that theme. He gives the theme to the ministry team. He gives the theme to the pastor or the elders and the teachers, whoever's involved, and he gives the theme to the body. That doesn't mean the body's always cooperating. But he gives the theme. There is a theme. You, we, you come in here and, you know, let's say we're, we're, we're in the theme of um, warfare. Sp we're talking about spiritual warfare. The music is, is based on spiritual warfare. Our prayers are, are, are fiery and, and, and powerful because it's based in warfare. We're, we're bold as lions. Because the theme is warfare, if you follow what I'm saying. We tell you in the, in the sermon, you need to fight the enemy and stand strong in the evil day because the theme is warfare. So if someone who is wanting to be in the spirit, obviously, and wants to come up and bring a word, it's important that you don't bring a word that is contrary to the theme. You know, you don't want to get up here and say, I want to talk about the, 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 the errors of justification or the ideas of uh, God destroying sinners or God punishing people or getting up there with the idea of, you know, let's all talk about dancing. And how God answered my prayer on the telephone. Or how God provided a gas card when I was walking the streets. Or how God did something for my mother. And made a, uh, a, a provision of $10 to float by her leg. And she reached out and grabbed it and shouted hallelujah. You say, but those are, those are cool stories, aren't they? Sure, but they're out of theme. It's not where God is going here in that particular message or series or the moving service was not about any of that and that can become a distraction at best and it can be very deadly at worst in the sense that a wet blanket thrown on... Let me give you a silly example. We, we one time had a service up in the Cabot House and the Spirit of God was moving. There was a spirit of joy, a spirit of, 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 of levity and happiness. And people were all hey, you know, high-fiving, hail fellow, well-meant. God is doing something great. This is how good we feel. And then someone flagged me down. We even had happy music. And someone flagged me and said, I got something to give. And I'm like, whoa, we need good Bring on a testimony. This is what we need, good stuff. And they got up, and they had the microphone, and everybody calmed down going, yeah, what do you got? What do you got? And they go, my dog died last week. And I'm so lonely. And you say, well, but brother, but brother, you know, the heart... We need to be sensitive to people. No, they need to be sensitive to the realm, and they need to be sensitive to the spirit. You know, we all got a wet blanket thrown on us, and we're all, her dog. And I'm just saying, where is the healing? Where's the miracle? Where's the testimony? Where's the thing that's supposed to cause us to have greater joy? It never came from the testimony. So please continue to pray for me to have hope and strength and maybe get another dog. Thank you, Pastor, for letting me talk. I'm like, you're welcome. Just flatten everybody out. Contrary to theme. Tenor is the general meaning or sense or content of something that is prevailing, such as character and direction. 
tenor relates to the people. So we not only need to be in theme, but the people themselves. It's important that you are in tenor with what's happening. You know, you got you, you, you got to uh, relate to what's happening. And, and again, you know, but God gave me a word, brother. God gave me a word. Okay, so that, what, what that lady did was a t- an attempted testimony that shot everybody down. But God still, still does move. Did you know that? He still moves. And he can put a word on somebody, a word of wisdom, a word of uh, prophecy, or a word of um, uh, knowledge. And that word can come in, and you say, well, if God gave me a word, and it's in the assembly, it must be for me to deliver it, and it must be now. Why, if he didn't give it to me yesterday, he gave it to me today, if he, he must want me to speak it today. That's not necessarily true, because there is a certain discipline of learning, as the scripture says that the spirit of prophecy is subject to the prophets, you need to wait and learn to wait for the right time so that you are in order in your tenor, you're connecting to what is going on, and you're recognizing the theme. And if, and if you're hearing something about how many scoops of ice cream you got last week, and you're going to find a way to spiritualize that, that God was bringing on the joy, and you bring that up, and the theme is about hellfire and brimstone, then you're out of line, and you need to keep your word and save it until where it works. And you can can subject your prophetic word until the timing is right. I I, I don't want to give you the whole thing, but I'll give you an example. I had a prophetic word when I was in my training church uh, up in Ashland, and uh, this was 28, 29 years ago, and um, I was in the congregation of about 500 people, and I was sitting there, and I really felt strongly that God had a word that he put on my heart, and I just felt it, and, and I told the pastor the previous Wednesday that I'd been carrying that word for about three days, he goes, he goes, you just wait until the right time, brother. You know, when, when, well, it obviously it'll be when you can tell it to the whole church, but make sure you wait for God's timing on that. I was like, okay. Um, and I didn't really know a lot about theme and tenor, but I, I began to understand it at that time. And so the t- a certain time came, and uh, the, the following week, and the service was going on. I'm going, oh, I hope I can give my word. hope I can give my word. No, you know, the music was in some other direction, and the, the, the message was in another direction, and you don't interrupt a message anyway, so I'm like, well, I, this ain't the week. Then another week goes by, same kind of thing. Music went a certain way, message went a certain way, and I'm like, this doesn't have anything to do with what I got to give. God gave me a word. This church is off. I need to... <laughs> it's like the people that look at their own kid walking in a parade, and they're, they're, they're excited watching their kid going down in the big parade. And they say things, hey, look at that. You know, the whole parade is off except for my kid. No, your kid is off. Everyone else is on. The church is on. You need to make sure you're on. So, <laughs> so a third week comes, and the music goes a certain direction. And I start sensing something going, hmm. Then all of a sudden... The music ended, and the pastor gets up and starts preaching. And you, I mean, I was raised, respectively. You don't interrupt the preacher. You don't interrupt the sermon. So I'm not going to. But all of a sudden, I, my hands break out into a sweat. I'm recognizing that the theme of the message that he's preaching is right in line with my delivery and with what i got to give him. I'm like, oh. my heart starts beating. I'm starting to go, whoa, this is it. This is it. But I can't interrupt the sermon. I can't interrupt the pastor. But God will tell him. God will clue him in. And he's going on and on and on. And when I told the pastor three or four weeks before that that I had a word, I went to tell him, and he said, I don't want to hear it. <laughs> That's what he told me to hold on to it. He goes, I don't want to hear it. He goes, not until it's time. He goes, don't even tell me. So I never told him, so he would not recognize by knowledge the connection. He would have no idea what I'm going to say. So he's preaching. And he's making this great point. And he's pontificating. <laughs> and he's pre- power preaching. And he's, he's saying his thing. And I'm sitting there in this crowd going, any moment now. And all of a sudden, right in the middle of his message, 
He goes, he goes, so you get my point, don't you, Danny? Just like that. He goes, and I'm like, so I recognized the theme was right, the tenor was right, I'm in line with that, and that is the flow of the Spirit now. Now it's get up and give it. I gave it, and it was so powerful, not because I had anything good to say, but it was because of what God had given me to give. It was so powerful that it, it completely sent the church in a, in a different direction. After, after I got done speaking, the pastor, I turned to walk away, and he said, he said hold on, son. He said, he, said, he said, stay right there, for the Lord is saying unto you, and then he began to prophesy what that dream that I shared with him uh, that I shared with the congregation, what it actually meant. Began to interpret it right there, and then prophesied to me about its fulfillment, which did come to pass, by the way. And, uh, and he, said, he said, for me to do anything else now, the, this is why I love the tuned-in pastor he was at that point, and he said, for me to do anything now would be anticlimactic to what the Spirit is doing right now. So I'm ceasing the sermon, and we went into a fit of praise and worship, and and then, um, next thing you know, there was a line of people who all wanted to talk to me. It was quite an amazing experience. But anyway, the, the value of timing is everything. Learning the theme, tenor, and flow. You don't want to get up with something that's totally off base of what you're trying to get across. The flow we speaks of, a steady stream. A steady stream. When you, when, when you see a flow of a river, it's just moving right along. It's moving right along. You don't get up and counter that stream with something that's totally off base from what's happening. You know, the Bible talks about quenching the Holy Spirit. And you don't want to do that. You don't want to quench the Holy Spirit of God. You, wanna, you want to move into that flow. You don't want to be like a salmon fish that's fighting against the flow. Now, salmon are positive in most other illustrations, but in this case, the river is flowing down and the salmons are going up against the stream. That's counterproductive when that happens in the spirit. We don't want to go against the flow of God, nor do we want to build a dam to try to block the flow or draw attention to ourself. You know, sometimes people do that, you know. Back in the olden days, before they were using mic etiquette, microphone etiquette, you know, people would shout out, you know, a prophecy or shout out a tongue, an interpretation from their chair. You know, and uh, I get that there are times that if you're bringing forth a word, you know, you need to make sure that, you know, who, the worship team that's ministering is hearing and seeing what's going on, which we are, both myself when I'm leading or when my son is leading, we are aware and we're paying attention that if God begins to give you something, typically it usually happens during praise and worship. However, you need to make sure that you get an agreement with the worship team that is in the process of doing their job. They're ministering. And when you, if you just interrupt them because you want to talk about how you had an experience in the bathtub and try to make that somehow work, that doesn't mean it's going to work. Again, you could break the flow. You know, so... You know, it's important that you don't try to interrupt the flow of the Spirit. Make sure what you have is going to be in agreement. Otherwise, hold it. That's why when Paul said in the word we read about speaking in tongues, he said, you know, if, there, if there's an utterance in tongues, you know, make sure someone's there to interpret. Unless you're planning on interpreting yourself. Otherwise, quiet down and speak yourself into God in tongues. Don't make a big scene, you know, people start off, you know, yabba dooba dabba, and, and uh, they'll, they'll say what they say, and then all of a sudden they crank up the volume to make sure you know, I got something. And then all of a sudden the church hears it, the worship leader hears it, and so everything kind of comes down to a low, and we, okay, you got the floor, brother, sister. And they, then they stop, and they ain't got nothing to say because they didn't have the interpretation, and they didn't see if anyone else had the interpretation, and it turns out that the flow was not even going in that direction. I've had moments where we've been in church service and we've seen things, we can tell the Spirit of God is moving in a certain way. We can tell. It's quiet. There's, there's something happening. And th there's, there's a spiritual lull in the moment. And, I'm, and I, I could be right there playing my guitar 
gently or softly or whatever and sensing any minute now something's going to happen. And also, bah, 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 you know, someone, someone might start speaking in tongues or someone may, may, you know, come up to us and say, I've got a word or they'll, they'll check with an elder and say, I've got something. You know, we need that and that's very important. But there's a whole thing about that too because in the 21st century, you can't just blurt out. It's not always going to be received well. And we've learned some things on how to function in the 21st century. So we have some microphones and we have etiquette. And we will work together communicating with the worship team and the one who wants to bring forth a word. You need to be doing your part of being theme, tenor, and flow. Um, but you need a little bit of technology knowledge too, such as when you take a microphone, you know, you don't hold the microphone down here by your belly button and expect us to pick up the airwaves. It ain't going to happen. And if you're, if you're coming out with something very important, you can't go, so Jesus said to me that we should all just love God. You know, and everybody's going, what? And that can actually become distracting and harmful because you've got something good to give and we can't hear it. And then we've got to shout out, hold up the microphone. Put it on your ear. Put it in your mouth. Do something with it. Turn it on. <laughs> you, know? you know? And then you got the people who go to the other spectrum of that, and they'll grab the microphone like they're the pros, and they'll go, hey, give me this thing. Is this on? Is this working? And then they'll grab and they go, oh, hello? Anybody there? And we're all like, we were here. We're not here now. And it's like, you know, maybe they'll go out and crack a joke right off the bat. Humor is fine in the right place. I mean, for goodness sakes, if you're talking about Jesus, you know, ministering to those who are broken or the orphans or the people who are hurting, and you get up and start cracking jokes, you're, all, you're out of tune. Which brings me to the last part that I want to talk about, and then I'll end for, the, for today. And that is tone. Tone. Theme, tenor, flow, tone. Tone means the general feel or character of something. It goes along with your delivery. Tone is attitude, spirit, feeling. A biblical example is to call us to speak the truth which is the action with love which is the tone so if the theme tenor and flow is love and peace and grace it would be a grave error to deliver a message of action of doom I remember one time we were in a service years ago and an up and coming prophetic voice learning how to hear from God but certainly in my mind, blew it that day. Um, we, had a, we had a beautiful, exact kind of service of that. It was beauty, it was love, it was God's mercy, it was God's forgiveness, it was God's grace. And people were all kind of basking in that moment. And a prophetic person said, I've got a word. And I said, okay, come on down. You're the next contestant. And they came up and they got up and they paused for a moment. Tears began to flow. Temperament, tone, and style suddenly changed into a grim doom. And this person said, God showed me a vision that he's going to destroy P-Town and blow the place up with fire. And all those who've committed that horrible sin will be destroyed. Yea, not many days hence from now. We were all like, Love and mercy of God has flown the coop. That prophetic word was 30 years ago. Still hasn't happened. It was out of tone. It was out of balance. It was out of theme. It was out of direction. And it did not apply or belong. 
If a bomb was dropping, it would be incorrect and insensitive tone to pass out ice cream and tell everyone to just chill. Do you get the difference? If bombs were going off and I go, stop panicking, quick, get the ice cream. Let's just be happy, (laughs) you know. But they just blow up your house. Yes, I know, but ice cream seems so good right now. You're just on the wrong page. If we are on stage and people are ministering on the grace and the love of God, it would be totally insensitive to get up and say, I've got a word to share, and then condemn adultery, or fornicators, or liars, or cheaters, or stealers, and then walk away and say, you get that? All right, let's get back to the love. What? I'm being silly, you know that, right? But you get my point? That's what happens. Okay, so it would be just as bad to talk about, we mentioned before, your dead dog or how much you share. Now listen, it's important. I remember, look it, we do, we do, we actually need to have some times when we have testimonies. I'm, I'm for that, you know? Sometimes it's apropos, correct, and right to do it on a Sunday morning. But other times, because we are, in a, we are in a structure of service, somewhat, we, we, again, we allow for the operation and flow of the Spirit, but we have a general structure and a flow we need. Okay? Um, so sometimes Sunday morning is not the best time because, again, when someone's giving a testimony, I know people who do not know how to give testimonies. And when they give one, I'm terrified of what they're going to say because... If they don't know how to keep it brief and keep it short and keep it powerful, if you don't know how to do it, you got, you need, maybe you need a little encouragement before you get up there or talking to someone you know, who can help you with that. But the facts are is when you are bringing forth a testimony, it needs to be brief. It needs to be to the point. In other words, I once was lost and now I'm found. You know? Or, I struggled in this area all my life. Then I learned something, and now I am this person, and I am free of that struggle. Everyone then can go, whoa, a testimony. You know? You know, you can't get up there and go, you know, I asked God to heal my headache the other day, and he did. And we're going to go, cool, headaches stink. Yeah. And then you say, but yesterday I found out I had cancer. <laughs> Please pray for me, brother. And you're like, okay, where's the testimony? Do you get what I'm saying? You got to have, if you're going to say, I'm going to, I want, back in the day, they would say, I got to testify. I once was struggling. I faced those demons of drugs and alcohol. I saw the devil face to face. I swear he came out of hell and he came into my back door. Kicked open that door, and yes, the devil had blonde hair, blue eyes, and a body that would kill. <laughs> and I fell by the sword on that cold, dark night where I lit a fireplace and made us both comfortable. Had some wine and. <laughs> what? <laughs> All right. You, you get what I'm saying? <laughs> if you're going to give me a testimony, can you give me a testimony? If we're in a quiet moment of reflection, it would still be tonally insensitive, tonally insensitive, if we're in a quiet moment of reflection to encourage people to reflect, but to do so in a tone that is contradiction to the quietness of the moment. You know? In other words... If we're in a tone, if we're in a quiet moment, and I'm like, everyone be still. Spirit of God is moving. I don't want any moving around right now. We need to be gentle and we need to be sensitive. God is speaking. God is, God is working here right now. Now, see, you, you all can receive from that, right? You know? Well, I, I need the band to work with me on this, too. Because they can't go, go off into playing ACDC, right? At the point, right? Number one, number two is you can't, I can't convince you of what I'm trying to say 
about being gentle and remaining in that aspect with coming out with a tone that is gleeful and, you know, jumpy and, and um, loud and boisterous. You know, everybody listen. The Spirit of God is moving. So you want to make sure that you let God touch you. You say, well, yeah, you preach like that. <laughs> yeah, I'm allowed to do that. But I'm not going to do that contrary to the moment we're in. If we're in a moment, like we're in a moment now of attention getting. I'm getting your attention. <laughs> That's my intent. To have you walk out going, my attention. <laughs> But that's the attention we're in. That's the mode we're in. And you need to make sure your tone and presentation, your delivery of what you want to bring, is parallel and equal to what's being said. That's what Paul meant when he said, with those who are weeping, weep. With those who are joyful, be joyful. Right? It's important to be relatable to the theme, tenor, flow, and tone of what is going on. All right. So there, those are some of the aspects of spiritual etiquette, and there's a lot more. But again, these are the early things that we need to know as a church, because I'll tell you, when a church has learned how to be sensitive to God, sensitive to one another, sensitive to the theme, tenor and flow and tone, I'll tell you, you can become a church that God will actively drop in his words and move in his spirit and work in his gifts and we won't be able to stop the people from coming through the front doors because they're going to want to be part of that. Because we're not a church where this guy does everything. We're in a church where we all have something to give. We all have something to do. We all can contribute. And that's how God wants to work this church and how he really wants to work all churches. Although some churches shut that down and don't allow that. Well, we're not that kind of a church. We want to allow that. But we have to have some order and decency. The apostle said, let all things be done decently and in order. So as to edify, build up, not tear down and break hearts. Okay? All right. That's all I can say for today. Um, again, this message is about the realm of, of the spirit. The, and for the good of the realm. For the right working of the realm. For the true success of the realm that you belong to. We need to be people who learn how to live in the realm, not just visit the realm and become part of it. Do you follow what I'm saying? Amen. Amen. So, Father, we pray in Jesus' name that this message has helped and instructed and touched the lives of all the Pentecostal and charismatic people who are listening, that, God, you will open our ears, eyes, and help us to understand that you don't want to, you will not work through confusion, but you will work through the, your spirit uh, that works in theme, tenor, and flow. And uh, we thank you for this, Lord, and thank you for building us up and giving us the opportunity to allow you to work through us. In Jesus' mighty name, amen and amen. Well, God bless you. I encourage you to be here next week as we take this to about three levels deeper, and uh, we're going to continue to do that until this has been exhausted. God bless. <laughs>